<laughs> I'm going to tell you, um, it's just been in my heart with the Lord about how God wants to encounter us. He wants to have an encounter with us. He wants to uh, have us involved in God encounters. He wants us to encounter God. It's just been in my heart all week, encountering, encountering, encountering God. Because when you encounter God, you change. When you encounter God, you change. And you go through the Bible, it's all about when man encountered God, things changed. Noah encountered God. He built the ark. Saved humanity because of an encounter with God. Abram had an encounter with God. And God said, leave, leave your country. Come follow me. And Abram became Abraham, the father of many nations, out of encountering God. Moses encountered God. He saw the, that burning bush over there, and he turned aside. And, but out of that encounter with God, Moses delivered Israel. Moses became the deliverer. Joshua encountered God. Because it says that when they were in the presence of God, when Moses left, Joshua stayed. He encountered God. He loved God's presence. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, David, you just, everybody in the Bible... Gideon, it was an encounter with God that made them what God wanted them to be. You and I could never be who we're supposed to be without encountering God. He's not a God of the distance. He's a God who's with us. Jesus encountered God as the Son of Man. When he was water baptized, the Spirit of God came on him like a dove and filled him. He encountered God. On the Mount of Transfiguration, he encountered God. And out of all these encounters, it was preparing the Lord to go to the cross to fulfill the will of the Father for us. Every encounter with God changes us. Saul encountered God. Saul of Tarsus changed him. He became probably the greatest apostle, wrote about 55 57% of the New Testament because of one encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ changed him. But then there was continuing encounters. God just doesn't want one encounter, but it takes one encounter to get your attention. First, first encounter every one of us in this room have had was when we got born again. That was your first encounter with God. Now, he may have spoke to you before, but that encounter changed your life, caused you to become a new creation. The story of Mary receiving the power of the Holy Spirit come upon her and becoming pregnant, she encountered God through the angel Gabriel. Sometimes we've encountered God through angels. When Joseph was thinking about putting Mary away, in a dream, an angel appeared to him. He encountered God through an angel. And he, the angel said, this baby is from the Holy Spirit. When, God, when you have a God encounter, he's revealing things to you about himself, about the kingdom, about his call in your life, about what he wants you to do in life. Because you and I won't know what to do in life unless we have an encounter with God. We've received the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us into all truth, to show us things to come, to reveal everything that Jesus has to declare to us, because everything Jesus has is from the Father. So because we have the Holy Spirit, we're living in a constant encounter with God. There's a dynamo on the inside. Sometimes we choose the encounter. 
by desire for him. David was always desiring more of God, always desiring to see God in the sanctuary. And David, you can read all the Psalms, and you can see where David encountered God, encountered God, encountered God. Especially going to war, he would encounter God, and he'd go out and take the victory. Joshua, the only time he missed, uh, didn't get victory, is when he didn't seek the Lord, and he went and did it in his own, own strength. Moses also tried to become the deliverer in his own strength, and he ended up in the wilderness for 40 years. <laughs> We know that Abraham tried to produce a child himself and ended up with Ishmael. Sometimes when we have a God encounter, when God speaks to us, there's knowledge that comes and we have to wait for wisdom. Abraham got impatient, and when you get impatient, you're going to produce a work of the flesh. I believe that this coming year is going to be a year of great encounters with God. God himself, perhaps in dreams or visions or angels, or just more than anything, just the Holy Spirit being more sensitive to his voice, being able to hear what he's saying and then to do it. Because you see, great encounters with God affects humanity. Not only does it affect you and your family and you personally, but it affects the world. It affects the body of Christ. It affects your neighbors. It affects countries. Last year when, when um, David and Darlene, when Darlene had an, she had an encounter with God about going to Scotland, just, she just burned in her. And I think a lot, of, a lot of us just try to say, now, Darlene, you know, we know that could be God and stuff. But no, she wasn't going to quit. She knew that she knew that she knew that God spoke to her. And she went over there, her and David, and, and I'm telling you, the impact they've had on Scotland is still ongoing. They didn't just go over there to be there and leave. They went over there and parted a desire for revival, and they unified hundreds of pastors. I'm, I'm not kidding on that. I mean, just... And, and it's going to keep going. They just planted a seed that's going to keep growing and growing and growing. But she forsook her and David. You know, how many of you would do what they did? They left everything here, went over to Scotland, simply on one deal that God sent us. And they drove all around Scotland. God gave them such favor with the pastors over there because she had an encounter with God. Now, she could have let people talk her out of that. There are always dream stealers because they don't have your dream. And they can't have your dream because God didn't give them that dream. He gave you that dream. And when you have an encounter with God, you've got to be aware of something. There's going to be those that's going to try and steal that encounter from you. And one of the persons that might steal it the first is yourself. Oh, God, you surely wouldn't do that through me. And you talk yourself right out of what God could do. But when God comes and you encounter him, because he's encountering you first, you always have to live in faith then. Encounters with God has to have faith to be fulfilled. Joshua opened his heart and Felt like Japan and Hong Kong was on his heart last year, this past year, a few months ago. And he finally opened his heart and said, yes, Lord. And guess what? Out of that encounter, he went to Japan, he went to Hong Kong, and it's just amazing how God fulfilled what he encountered Joshua to do. But Joshua had to step out in faith because he was in my office a few times, and I just kept encouraging him, Joshua, just go for it. Look, it took a lot of money to get over there. And the thing about Joshua, not only did God supply the money to go over there, but through your, your generosity and others, he gave $1,000 away just to bless people over there. Why? Because the encounter of God, he said yes. 
in all of his weakness, in all of looking at, in all of Darlene and David's weaknesses, who are we to go to Scotland? They don't even know our name other than Pastor Joe and, and uh, Rob, Pastor Rob and Banff. But see, when you obey God, he, encounter you, he encounters you for a purpose. He wants to do something in your life. He wants to do something through your life. He wants to be glorified in you, and he wants you to glorify him. But I'm telling you, every encounter you have with God, you have to step out in faith. Think about Noah. All those years building the ark. And whether you realize it or not, up to that time, it had never rained on earth. They didn't know what rain was. Water was, it says, out of the, you know, the water was, the earth was watering itself without rain. So, Noah did two things. He introduced a foreign concept to them. It's going to rain. It's going to flood the earth. And he was building an ark, huge, and there's no water around. He must look pretty stupid. And I'm sure for all those years he worked on the ark, He had to put up all the time with people probably coming out and th making fun of him. I can see him coming out there and having picnics and just watching him build that ark and making fun of him. Oh, look at Noah's folly here. But it didn't deter him. It did not deter him because the encounter with God was so much stronger than the pull of the world and what his friends thought or anybody else. And guess what? He saved humanity. Not only that, he saved the animal kingdom. Think about Moses. He knew he was called to be the deliverer of his people. So he kills the Egyptian thinking that they would know that he would be their ruler. The next day when he found the two Hebrew guys fighting, he tried to interrupt them, and the one guy said, are you going to kill me too like you did the Egyptian? And Moses fled. When God, when he had an encounter with God in the burning bush, changed everything. Changed everything. And Moses is like a lot of us. He made every excuse not to obey God. Well, God, what are they going to do if I, I mean, if I can't just show up there and tell them, look, I've been sent by God? And he said, what am I going to do? And he said, here, show me. Put your hand in, in your bosom. And he pulled it out. It was white with leprosy. He said, now put it back and come out. It was, it was per perfect. Throw your rod down. Turn into a snake. Pick it up. Turn back into a rod. He said, show these two signs to the people. Okay. But God, I can't speak. I stutter. Now, this is interesting because if you read about Moses, it says he was eloquent in speech when he was, when he was an Egyptian prince. Isn't that something? So God said, well, okay. Basically, God is saying, I knew you was going to say that, so Aaron's on his way. Your brother's coming. He'll speak for you. But you're going to speak for me. Okay. Strike two. He still, still had to go and obey God. Now, Moses wasn't perfect, but he did obey. And out of that obedience, he became the deliverer of Israel. Gideon, when God called him, this is what he said to him. He said, Hell, thy mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. And Gideon said, me? My family is the least of all the tribes of Israel, and I'm, I'm the very least in my family. In other words, I'm the least of the least. Are you kidding me? You're calling me a mighty valor man? of, <laughs> And yet... He put a fleece out there, first of all, before the angel of the Lord, and said, if you are the angel of the Lord, he went and fixed him something to eat, and the angel of the Lord burned it up. And 
And then he asked for a fleece, and he did all that. But you know what? He went out perfectly in, in God's will. But when God told him to tell, tell, tear down the image of Baal, he said he did it at night so that they didn't know who was going to do it. But he still did it. And then they found out who did it. They came to his father and said, we want, we come, bring your son out here. We're going to kill him. And his father said, wait a minute, wait a minute. If Baal is God, let, God, let, let Baal defend himself. So they let him off. And they changed Gideon's name to Jeroboam or something like this. It means this, let Baal defend himself. And we know that, Dave, that he went from 30,000 soldiers... And God said, that's too many. Cut it, that's too many. Finally went, got down to 300. And now God says, now people will know that I will deliver you, not men. Gideon was still not sure. And, the, and so an angel of the Lord spoke to him and said, all right, take your servant, Perth, and sneak down to the camp of the Midianites. And the Midianites had 30,000 soldiers down there. Or, or no, I think they had a hundred and some thousand soldiers. So they sneak to the camp and they're listening, and they're hearing them talk around the campfire, so to speak. They're around the fire, and one of them said, "I had a dream last night, and this dream, this barley loaf just come rolling down the hill and just 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 maul all of us, and just run over us all." And the other guy said, "I know what that dream is. God's going to send Gideon to destroy the Midianites." And Gideon knew then that God was with them. So what I'm saying to you is this. You're going to have some more encounters with God because God has to wake his church up for what's coming. A great revival is coming on the earth. And he has to awaken his church because revival comes through the church. A people that's awake and ready to obey God and say yes to the will of God. So God has to awaken his church by divine encounters. And the, the encouragement is this. Nobody but Jesus perfectly obeyed God. Nobody did. And yet, in their imperfection, they accomplished the will of God. Peter Denied the Lord. And yet, that rain, there was forgiveness. And as a result of it, Peter became a great apostle. Not because he was perfect. Even after he became an apostle, he had a hard time ministering to the Gentiles. God had to give him a vision of the sheet coming down it three times. And then when he got to the Gentiles, then he realized, oh, now I know what that vision was all about. God's telling him, don't call anything uncommon that he's called common. In other words, he was saying the Gentiles are going to get saved. And he sent Peter to the Gentiles. And then God had to do something very supernatural. Even while Peter was still speaking, the Spirit of God fell on him. Because I think God had to convince Peter that he was choosing the Gentiles to get saved just as much as the Jews. And then when he went back to the Jews, they said, we heard you were with the Gentiles. Basically, don't you know they're dogs? We're not supposed to talk to them. And, and Peter, and with the men that was with him, said, listen, the Holy Spirit fell on them just like us. We heard them speaking in tongues and prophesying, and, they were, and we baptized them in water. Who are we to say no to God? Then the Jew says, now we perceive, and it's quoted scripture, that God has now brought salvation to the Gentiles also. In other words, they had to be convinced. They had to fight through some theology. They had to fight through some uh, misunderstanding. But because they were faithful 
to the encounter that God put in their heart, on, our, on their life, God's will was done. Not because they were perfect. Not because they did it perfectly. But they stayed obedient. They stayed obedient. Even when Peter, after the Lord was risen and stuff, what did Peter say? He said, I'm going fishing again. <laughs> I'm going to go back to what I was before Jesus called me. I'm going fishing. Now, you would think that the Lord would come and upbraid them out there in a the fishing boat. See, a lot of Christians think that, oh, well, God would just sink their boat and let them all drown because they disobeyed him. Listen, that's law-based teaching, and there's a lot of teachers out there that would teach that. What did Jesus do? He fixed breakfast for them. Fixed breakfast. He didn't stand on the shore and wave a magic wand, I'm here, I'm God. He fixed breakfast because if you fish all night, you're hungry. But then he said, have you caught any fish, children? No. Throw your net over on the other side. And then a net began to break, and then Peter said, it's the Lord. And he jumped out of the boat and swam to shore. And Jesus restored him and was walking with him on the beach, restoring him. See, God wants to encounter us with grace. Not law, not judgment, but grace. But grace is God's ability to accomplish what only you can do in his strength. But if you don't humble yourself, grace is there, but it can't work because grace only works through obedience and humility. And grace is God's ability to accomplish what he's told you to do. You, you and I can't do it in our own strength. But we have to learn to obey. We have to say, yes, Lord. And in, in all these years of ministry, Dorothy and I, going on 47 years, um, there's been many times I didn't want to do anything. I wanted to quit. I mean, it's hard out there sometimes. You pour your life into people, and they just walk away and curse you and stab you in the back. And I had a lot of opportunities to get bitter and not, not continue in the vision. They always have those vision stealers that, oh, that's not true. God's not ever going to do that. You've got to hang on to God's promise when he encountered you. And I won't let go. And we will see it come to pass. Because I believe it with all my heart. There was the uh, lepers. And uh, the army had uh, seized. They had actually had surrounded Jerusalem. And nobody could come in. Nobody could go out. So the people inside were literally starving to death. And the prophet came and said, this time tomorrow, your enemy will be destroyed. And you'll have all their spoils. And one of the lieutenants stood up and said, I don't believe that. And the prophet said, you will not see it, but it will come to pass. So the next day, the lepers are sitting there at the gate and says, you know what? If we sit here, we're just going to die. Let's just go to the enemy's camp and see if they'll have mercy on us. If they kill us, they kill us. We're going to die either way. So on their way to the enemy's camp, lepers, God went before them and sowed confusion in the enemy's camp. They started killing one another. They started running. And by the time the, the, the lepers got there, everybody was gone except all the cattle, all the food, all the spoils. So they went back and told the people. And there was a stampede running. And guess what happened to that lieutenant? He got trampled to death. He didn't believe God. Now, I'm not saying that. In a context, if you don't believe God, you're going to get trampled to death. I'm not saying that. This is in the Old Covenant. But I am saying this, that you can miss God through unbelief. You're not going to get trampled, and God's not going to, he's not even going to be mad at you. 
but we can miss the blessing. The point I'm making in that is, he didn't, the prophet told him, he said, it's going to come to pass, but you're not going to be able to see it. And this is, the, here's, the, here's the principle, you know, the Old Testament is like a type and shadow. Our unbelief can keep us from seeing the promise that God said to us. Am I making sense? And what God wants to do is awaken you to the song we sang this morning. No matter, don't matter what the circumstances look like, God's working. Doesn't matter. God's working. And see, where we miss God when we have encounters with God is that we can sit here and say, well, God, um, I'll, I'll do this if you'll do that. So we try and bargain with God. It's kind of like if you want to walk on water. God says, walk on water. Well, see, we want to go in the middle of winter in Lake Erie when the, when the ice is about three to four foot thick and you can drive a truck on it. Then I'm ready to walk on water, Lord. I see this truck sitting out there driving all over this lake, and I believe I can walk on it. God doesn't do that. It takes faith to obey him. It takes faith to step into the encounter of God. Mary, most beautiful word you'll ever hear when, when she said to the angel Gabriel, how, how am I going to be proud? I don't even know a man. I'm a virgin. And she said, the most high will overshadow you. The power of the most high will come upon you. And that holy child, that holy thing, you'll name him Jesus. She said, be it unto me according to your word. That's the voice of faith, the written word of God. Be it unto me according to your word. Thank you. All the promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. We can claim any of those, like there's 6,000 promises. They're ours in Christ Jesus. They're all yes and amen in Christ Jesus for us. All we have to do is believe them and act on them. But then there's the rhema word of God where God can speak to you by angels or he can speak to you through a prophet or through a prophetic word. Someone can give you a prophetic word. But he can speak to us through the logos or the rhema or through angels, through a brother or sister speaking in a word of prophecy or wisdom or knowledge to you. But you have to believe it. You have to step out in faith and say, God, I believe it. When Dorothy and I was called, I knew I was called in the ministry when I was a little boy, but finally when I answered the call, we was teaching school. I was teaching school, and, and um, we had Tanya. And I knew it was time to go out into the ministry. I knew it was time. God had dealt with me and dealt with me and dealt with me. Finally, I said, yes, Lord. And I, I resigned at the end of that year. You know, I didn't renew my contract. I'd been teaching two years. And all I knew was a Methodist church, so I went to the Methodist pastor, and anyway, we went to seminary in Idaho School of Theology in Denver, Colorado, and, and um, we then went there and applied and got accepted. And all of a sudden, I got a call from two superintendents and said, do you want a student charge? And I said, I don't know. What is a student charge? <laughs> he said, while you're going to school, you can pastor churches. So there's two little country churches right out, out in, in uh, Eastern Colorado, northeastern Colorado, way in by Ray and Holyoke and Yuma, Colorado, in that area. Two country churches, Pleasant Valley and Wages. And uh, they said, you can actually pastor those churches while you're going to school. And they said, normally we don't do this. Normally you have to be in school one year. But because of your resume, I'd been in the military, I'd been teaching school for two years and everything. He said, we're going we're gonna to let you pastor these two churches if you want to. Of course, I said, sure, we want to do it. And then there's dormitories on campus. And we applied for it, and they said, I'm sorry, they're all booked up, and nothing there. Well, about two or three weeks before we moved out there, they, they, called, they uh, wrote me a letter and said, Mr. Van Winkle, we don't know how, but through uh, some uh, unusual circumstances, 
uh, an apartment has opened up for you. Do you want it? <laughs> we said, of course we do. So God supernaturally, point I'm making, he supernaturally opened the door for Dorothy and I. But Dorothy and I stepped through him by faith. When the Lord said to resign from the Methodist church, here I am an ordained Methodist pastor, guaranteed you have to, if they can't find a church for you, they have to give you a salary. You're guaranteed insurance. You're guaranteed, uh, listen, denominational pastors got it made. I'm serious. And when the Lord spoke to my heart and said, no, I want you to resign, and uh, I did. And my, my pastor friends were, what is wrong? Are you not crazy? What are you, what are you thinking? Giving up all, you better rethink this. And I said, no, I know what God said to me. And so we waited for, the, for about eight months. And then all of a sudden, somebody gave us $1,000 to go to Nellie Land, School of Theology, to go apply there, look at it in Anaheim, California. So Dorothy and I went out there and went to Disneyland while we were out there and applied at the school. And anyway, we ended up going back. We went out there, Dorothy and I and our three kids. At that time, two kids, and she was pregnant with Micaiah. No money, no guarantee of money, no nothing, just the word of the Lord said, come. And we stepped out there in faith and did it. And God took care of us faithfully. We didn't have enough money to, to apply for food stamps. I think back then you had to have $40 and you got like $200 worth of food. We didn't have $40 <laughs> to apply for food stamps. So we had some friends that were in college with us, and uh, they got food stamps, so they would tie their food stamps to us. And that's how we got our food. It's just amazing how God has taken care of us over the years. And, uh, you know, I've just walked with him too long now to doubt him. You just got to understand, church, the encounter with Almighty God, the God who created heaven and earth and all that there is, who is now your Father, and Jesus is your Lord, your Savior, your brother, your captain of the army. He's all these things to us. And we have the Holy Spirit of promise in us and with us. And is there anything too difficult for God? Is there anything God can't do? That's the God that's on the inside of us, church. That's the God that wants to encounter you with greatness, with greater things than you've ever known because he has need of his body to bring this great gospel of glory to the, this generation, to even cause nations to shake and tremble. He needs his church. He needs his apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, miracle workers. He needs his church baptized with the Spirit, with the gifts of God working through them. And the most, for me, the saddest thing on earth as Christians who go to heaven empty-handed because of the fear of man or self selfishness. I want to do what I want to do. Or unbelief. It's the saddest thing in the world to see a man and woman of God full of the Holy Ghost, full of power, able to change nations, able to, to save the lost, able to raise the dead, able, able to cast out demons, able to, to, to do anything God tells them to do, who can change nations if God tells them to, who can become John Wesley's, who become Deborah's, who can become Elijah's and Elisha's, who can become apostles, prophets, who has a powerful destiny on the inside only to go to the grave where that destiny is buried. The greatest treasures on earth is in cemeteries, buried in Christians who refuse to obey God. That's sad. To me, that's the saddest mix of people not knowing Jesus and ending up in hell. That's the saddest thing. The next saddest thing is Christians who go to heaven empty-handed. God wants to encounter you. And when God encounters you, see, and I'll tell you what's happened, and we're going to counter that. I'm going to counter this with everything that's in me by the Holy Ghost. The church has been taught by law 
not to obey God. Now you say, well, I've been to these other churches, and they tell me to obey God. They tell you to obey God on this condition. If you don't, God will get you. So you try and obey God in the flesh. And they basically tell you how you're to obey God. You come to this church, and you do this, and you do that, and you do this. And by the way, ladies, you can't preach. That's not God. That's a doctrine encounter, not a God encounter. So when I say this, that people, they are taught unbelief. And as a result, they were never exhorted by the Spirit, exhorted by leadership that can lay hands on them, exhorted by the Spirit that can stir up in them the gift of God, that can cause them to have an encounter with God greater than anything they've ever known before because God has a plan and a purpose for every one of his children. And it's significant and it's powerful and it's life-changing and it's world-changing and it's family-changing. It's city-changing. The only limit in your life is you. Shame on any of us if I let someone else limit me. I refuse. You will not limit me because I love you too much. If I let you limit me, I don't love you. If I bow to your unbelief, that's not love. But if I love you, you just hang around me long enough and you'll change. You say, that's pretty bold. Well, it's true. You're going to change whoever you, you're going to change according to who you hang around with. You hang around people of doubt and unbelief, you're going to walk in doubt and unbelief. You think we don't affect one another? We do. That's why it says we're to hang around those of like faith. To stir each other up, to encourage one another. There's greatness on the inside of us, but it all comes from an encounter with Almighty God. He wants to encounter you. In fact, He's going to. In dreams and visions, maybe angels. The Holy Spirit speaking. Maybe Jesus will appear to you. You can't limit God. Some of you have to have an encounter to change. Some of you are so bogged in unbelief, it's going to take God to knock you on the head to get your unbelief out of you. And I don't mean by sickness and disease. I mean, just think of one day Jesus stands at the foot of your bed and says, Stop unbelieving. Now start believing me. I guarantee you, you'll believe him after that. A divine encounter. Some of us, it's going to take a divine, divine encounter to change your hard hearts. To get you to be humble, to love your spouse, to love your mate, to love others. God's going to have to knock your door down. And I know he says, I knock, will anybody open? Yes, he will do that, but there's times he knocks the door down. Ask Saul of Tarsus. I mean, he met God, didn't he? And he changed. That's the good news. He changed. God met him to change him, not to kill him. Paul was so determined to destroy the church that Jesus come and said, no, you're not going to persecute me anymore. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Now get up and get going, but you're not going to see for a little while by the way, but there's going to come a man, Ananias, going to lay hands on you. You're going to get filled with the Spirit. Your sight's going to come back. And immediately after that, he went out telling people about Jesus Christ. So I believe this. God can knock your door down because he has such a plan and a purpose and a passion for you to do what he wants you to do. Some of you have been so hurt or so maimed or you're just so doggone stubborn, it's going to take God to knock your door down to get you going in the right direction. But it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I mean, it's a good thing if Jesus visits you. Try it over here. It's a good thing if Jesus visits you. He doesn't come to destroy. What does he come to do? He bring, comes to bring life and life abundantly. And there's many testimonies of people who Jesus appeared to them and radically changed them. 
I mean, they were anti-Christ, they were anti-this, they were anti-that, or, or some of them, uh, there's a Jack, uh, what's his name, Deer, he wrote the book Surprised by the Spirit. He was, a, he was a, one of the professors in Dallas Theological Seminaries. He was against tongues. He was against all this stuff and everything. And guess what? The Holy Spirit showed up and surprised him. Some of you are going to get surprised this year. You know why? You need it. God knows you need it. You know why? Because he needs you. He needs you to break you out of your little rut. You know what a rut is? It's a grave with both ends kicked out. You're going to have divine visitations this year. It's going to take that to wake you up. It's going to take him to bring you out of your stubbornness. It's going to take one moment, one second with God, and you're going to see how so like a little piece of dust you are compared to God. And yet he lives in you, that little piece of dust. He died for you, that little piece of dust. And he gave everything he has to you, that little piece of dust. And he made you, that little piece of dust, to have dominion over all the works of his hands. And that's why they say, who is this little piece of dust that God's mindful of him? And yet you've crowned him with glory and honor, and, and you have, he is just a little lower than yourself. You're significant. Everything God does, he has to do it through you. He made it that way. He gave you dominion. He gave us dominion, church, and he won't change his mind. And there's some things that he wants you to have some dominion over on earth for his name's sake, and it's going to take an awakening in you for him to do it. And guess what? That's what he's going to do this coming year. I, you can write it down. You can say, I don't believe it. I don't care. God's going to knock your door of unbelief down. And I'm going to say, Lord, tell them this. First thing, say to them, Pastor Rich told you so. <laughs> we are made in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. He deserves us to surrender everything to him so that he can be everything he's promised to be to us. How dare any of us be so stubborn, so prideful, so self-willed, that we have the audacity to think that we'll stand before God and he'll pat you on the back for your doubt, unbelief, your, your, your stubbornness, your selfishness. He will not do that. It won't be good, but it'll end up good. Whatever man sows, he reaps. Howbeit, God will not be mocked. Dear church, God in his great mercy is going to come. Now, this isn't grace. This is mercy. Grace operates through faith. Mercy comes when we're just so doggone stubborn, we refuse to operate in grace because we're not going to humble ourselves. We need mercy at that level. And God in his great mercy is going to knock on some of our doors. And guess what? It's going to be awesome. And listen to me. If you're doing everything right, we still need a knock on the door to do even more things right. Am I making sense? I mean, you could be doing it. God's not mad at you. He's saying, man, you are doing so good because you've been faithful. Now watch this. I'm going to open a door bigger than you ever could imagine before. Because those that are faithful in small things, they get bigger things. So some of you have been so faithful to God. I'm just going to say all of you, okay? But see, when God comes with a greater encounter, it's just to move you into more greatness. It's to move you into more things that he wants you to do. And he's pleased with where you're at. But he can't stay pleased if we stay there. Because we're being changed from glory to glory. I want to change more. I want a greater encounter with God. I want to see him more. I do with all my heart, and I will. Why? Because you'll be benefited. See, whenever you encounter God, others are going to be benefited with your encounter. 
Some of you just need this. Some of you need the Lord to come and show you how much he loves you. Because it says if we recognize his love and perceive it, we become filled with God. Some of you are so tender to the Lord, all he has to do is knock lightly. And you say, here, Lord. But he wants to come. And I, and I guarantee you this, every, every experience I've had with the Lord has been an encounter of love. An encounter of love. I've never had an encounter of, of condemnation or abuse or anything from God. It's always been a, when I needed it the most, he knocked on my door with love. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be love because God is love. But isn't that exciting news? I'm just giving you news before it happens. Everyone in this room, I believe it's God's doing it to all of his people, but I can only speak to you. You're going to have encounters with God. And it's going to be encounters of love and encounters of encouragement. But it's going to be encounters that takes your faith to move into it going to take your faith it's going to change some things in your life but it's going to change things in other people's lives that's the good news Does that sound good i don't know about you but i'm ready to have greater encounters with god i don't want to hold anything back but i also know this promise from god faithful is he that calls you faithful is he that will do it so, get ready, church. Great encounters with God's on the way. Because God has great things for us to do in these last days. And not any one of us is left out of that. Isn't that awesome? So what I want to do on Wednesday night is just come with expectation. Say, Father, here I am. I just want to minister unto you and the Lord, Holy Spirit, and you just... Speak, you do whatever you want to do, but I just want to admit, and I, I don't know what all is going to happen Wednesday night, but we can encounter a great outpouring of the Spirit. We can encounter a great manifestation of glory. Maybe Wednesday night will be the first start of your encounters with God. Are you ready for this? I, I, you remember that song or that game we used to play, Ready or Not, Here I Come? And there was one called Annie, Annie, Over. Red Rover. Send someone right over. Well, the Lord said, I'm coming over. <laughs> Ready or not, here I come. <laughs> because when he comes, church, he makes us ready. His love is so great. Father, I want to thank you that you've put this in my heart. But I believe it's Rhema from the Holy Spirit. That you love your people so much. You love your daughter. They, they, we can't even imagine how much you love us. We get glimpses of it. We experience it. But I believe you're going to bring great encounters of love to your people. So that they can become everything that you call them to be. That you can be glorified in them and them in you. That, Father, you are satisfied in Jesus' name. And Holy Spirit, you can have your perfect way with all of us. Amen. Amen. Well, it's going to be a year of encounters. You watch.